Matthew chapter 13. treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has, and buys the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had, and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea, and gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore. And they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said to them, Have you understood all these things? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he said to them, Therefore, every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these parables that he departed from there. Father, you know there's a lot of days that come and go where we just are out of sorts and nothing seems to be going right. And the one constant and everything is, is you. And you reveal your constancy and your beauty and your love, your undying, never ending <coughs> love over and over again through your word. Help us to see just how incredible, how almost unbelievable your love actually is. May it move our hearts and change our minds. Please clear this place of any evil that's found its way in. Drive it out and fill this your house with your Holy Spirit. <coughs> and all this we ask in the beautiful and blessed name of Jesus. Amen. So, we're at the tail end of a period in Jesus' ministry in which he is addressing the throngs of people around him in parables. Parables uh, that we've looked at so far seem to come in groupings, each with an underlying theme or idea behind them. Uh, the first was the parable of the sower, uh, which actually isn't a group, unless you count it with the explanation that's too. Um, <laughs> this parable and its explanation illustrated the ways in which Jesus' message would be received by the people. And then next we looked at the parable of the lamp, the parable of the seed that grows on its own, in the parable of the mustard seed. In these parables, Jesus shows us that his message, while veiled now <clears throat> in parables, would soon be available to all who would seek it, and that God would see to it that the message took root, grew, and produced a harvest, and that the growth of the kingdom would be supernaturally large, far beyond what anyone could have possibly ever imagined. The next set, the parable of the tares and its accompanying explanation, along with the parable of the mustard seed, again, and the parable of the leaven illustrates that the church of the kingdom would be a target of the enemy, who would sow false believers among the sons of God, and the devil himself would take up residence among the believers and introduce corruption that would, at times, thoroughly pollute the kingdom. Um, you could say that these parables have illustrated the who, what, when, where, and how of the kingdom. This week we get the why of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. With the parable of the soils, we see that there are four types of hearers of the gospel, and we can only say for sure that one of them truly hears and is saved. Um, <coughs> if the proportion of people to types um, was completely even, then Jesus is going to reach roughly one in four. 
that's really not all that big a return on an investment. Mm -hmm. um, yet, we see Guy going all in on his efforts anyways. Mm -hmm. and he causes the kingdom to grow to monumental proportions, only for it to be corrupted by the enemy. If one were to completely understand all the parables given up to this point, one might ask the question, why do it? Why do it? Um, we've already talked about all that the triune God gave up, and we're going to talk about it some more. Um, just to initiate this mission, um, and we know that completion of this mission will cost Jesus a price none of us can comprehend, let alone pay. So why do it when the payout seems so proportionately paltry when compared to the cost? And that is what the first two parables in this week's passage mm -hmm. show us. The why. Mm -hmm. Verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. I would be willing to argue that this verse and the one following it, or the two following it, are the this sentence and the sentence that follows are theologically the two deepest verses in the entire Bible. I would be willing to make that argument. If you wanted to metaphorically sum up the entire Bible narrative, if you wanted to boil down the entirety of God's plan to its core essence, if you wanted to symbolically summarize the entire Bible, you could not possibly come up with anything better than verses 44, 45, and 46. And these three verses, two sentences, could easily be ten teachings, and I don't know how many sermons. So forgive me. There's going to be some things left on the table tonight, and, and that would be awesome because you'll have questions and you'll go home and study and dig in, and that's okay. But gosh, I could go on a really long time with this stuff, and everyone would just be phenomenal. Um, these verses give us a 30,000 foot overview of the entire Bible. Um, you could call this a synopsis, synopsis of the whole of human history from God's vantage point. Um, now this passage is often taught that the treasure is Jesus and that uh, he is so valuable that getting him is worth selling everything you have to get him. And I'm sure many of you have heard it taught that way at various times. Um, and that statement is absolutely true. But this is absolutely the wrong verse to use to prove it. <laughs> um, why? Um, there are multiple reasons. I'm just going to highlight a few. One, you don't buy salvation. You can't. It's a free gift. There, there is nothing that we could ever have that would be worth what salvation would cost. So going out and selling all we got this is a waste of time. You can't buy salvation. Um, and there are other logical and theological reasons why this interpretation just does not work. And we get to pick it apart and look for them, if all of time allowed. But um, the more pressing reason why this interpretation does not work is you would have to lift it, <coughs> lift it, this verse entirely out of its context. You would have to just pick it up, <coughs> pluck it out, and try to make it a, a standalone thing um, to, to get it to be to begin to even sound like that's the right interpretation. It, it, you would have to completely divorce it from the context in which it's spoken. Um, in fact, you would have to completely ignore everything that immediately precedes this verse, uh, namely the explanation of the parable of the tares. Um, in the explanation of the parable of the tares and the wheat, uh, we get a key to understanding the parable of the treasure in the field. So let's look a little further up at verse 24, the beginning of the parable of the tares and wheat, Matthew 13, 24. 
another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. And then the explanation of that portion in verses 37 and 38. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the son of man, the field is the world, the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. So we have two common symbols between the parable of the tares and the parable of the treasure hidden in the field. They are the field and a man. From the parable of the tares, we know that the man, a man, is Jesus, and that the field is the world. So, that leaves us with one symbol not specifically explained by Jesus in the parable of the tares. While Jesus doesn't define it, um, I think he may have left it out because God's done a really good job of defining that already. Exodus 19.5 Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Deuteronomy 7.6 For you are a holy people to the Lord your God, the Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. Deuteronomy 4.12 For you are a holy people to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you. I, boy, it's practically the same sentence. <laughs> has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And Psalms 135.4 For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel for his special treasure. Mm. The treasure hidden in the field is the children of Israel. So in this parable we literally see a synopsis of the Old Covenant. God found a treasure in this world. One man and his wife who by faith would believe the promise that he made to them. And out of them came a great and mighty nation whom God hid away in the promised land of Canaan. Where he protected them and then he went and sold everything that he had to purchase the earth and thus that hidden treasure would be his. God, through Jesus, created the world and gave it all as a gift to his final creation, man. The one thing that he created, the only thing that he created in his likeness and image. And creation man held the title deed to the earth. But in a transaction that I don't fully understand, I'm not sure anybody fully understands, when man fell, that deed transferred to Satan. And we know this from Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. Luke 4, 5 through 8. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give to you and their glory, for it, this has been delivered to me and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. You just heard it. Satan claimed to own all the kingdoms of the world. Had Satan been lying about that, don't you think Jesus would have pointed it out? <laughs> He didn't, because Satan's claim is absolutely true. Go figure, one time. <laughs> Satan took the title deed to the earth by killing Adam when he tempted him into sinning against God. The first murderer was not actually Cain. It was Satan when he tempted Adam to sin, and that sin killed him spiritually immediately and eventually it took his physical life as well. 
We were created in the likeness and image of our Creator. We were created to be like Him, literally immortal. Death came as a result of sin. So if the earth transferred to Satan by the taking of a human life, then the price to purchase it back is a life. A perfect, innocent, sinless life. The life of Jesus was the price paid to purchase back the earth. In Revelation chapter 5, the Lamb who appeared before the throne of God in heaven, having the appearance of having been slain, takes possession of the scroll with seven seals, is Jesus. And that scroll he takes possession of is the title deed to the earth. He is the only one who could take it and open it because he was the one who purchased it back with his death on the cross. And that's why we celebrate the entirety of what Jesus did. Death, burial, and resurrection. Each one accomplished something different. Jesus' physical death on the cross put into escrow, as it were, the price to once again take possession of the earth. Thus, when the day comes, Jesus will lay a hold of that deed and once again have total legal authority over the earth and all that is upon it and within it. But there is still the problem of sin. The wages of sin is death. Death, by definition, is a separation. Most of us think um, separation of life from our body physical bodies, that is. Um, and that is a separation, absolutely. Um, but there's also a spiritual death. This is the death that happened when man fell. Spiritual death is a separation of our soul from spiritual life. It is a separation from God. <coughs> All the sin of the world was poured out on Jesus on the cross. And when his body was separated from its physical life, his spirit was cast into hell. And hell is nothing more than a place in which God is completely absent. Because God is everywhere, he had to literally create a space in which he would be absent. And that, absent, that place of his absence is hell or Gehenna. I promise I'm going to pull this all together in a few minutes, I swear. It's good. It's good. Before there was a heaven, before there was a cosmos, before there was a Milky Way galaxy, before there was a solar system with one little planet called, we call Earth, before there were angels, before there were trees, plants, oceans, and land, before there were animals, before there was a single human being at all, there was God. Amen. One perfect being in three persons living in perfect self-sacrificing love for one another, Father, Son, and Spirit. Before there was anything, there was the perfect love of God. That perfect love relationship is the most valuable thing God possessed. Because before anything existed, that did. And with a resounding blow heard across time and space, that love relationship was severed. And a piece of that perfect love went to hell, a place where the rest of the Godhead was completely absent. <clears throat> that is what we deserve. As sinners, as rebels against God, we deserve to be cut off from him for eternity. But for the love of the treasure in the field, Jesus suffered that fate for us. Amen. Jesus' death bought back the earth. His burial or his descent into hell absorbed the punishment due for our sins. And his resurrection destroyed that penalty, which was death. And he gives that same power to overcome sin and death to uh -huh. anyone who will simply believe and follow him. This is the best part. 
Here's the kicker. How did he do all of this? How did he sell all that he had and purchase the fuel? With joy. And it was foretold in scripture that it would be this way. The father would do this with joy. Isaiah 53.10 Yet it pleased Yahweh to bruise him. The son would endure this with joy. Isaiah 53.11 He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. And the writer of Hebrews tells us that this is exactly what the son did. Hebrews 12.2 Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, even if I could do this, even if I had the ability, I can promise you I would do it grumbling and complaining the entire way. There are stronger terms. I'm just, I can use them. I would be grumbling and complaining. Do you know what I am doing for you people? Do you know? Do you get what I'm about to do? Oh, and you're ungrateful. Not a one of you. I'm going to be left alone. And I would... And he didn't. He did it with joy. Father, Son, and Spirit each endured hell. And I believe on some level altered their perfect love relationship. That they enjoyed from eternity past and for eternity future. Jesus will stay For eternity future, Jesus will stay in a perfected human form with the wounds he suffered on the cross for eternity future. That is how we see him throughout the book of Revelation with no indication whatsoever that he will ever return to whatever form he possessed before the incarnation. And he did it all for the joy of taking possession of the treasure he found and then hid away in a field. Verses 45 and 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. I have to correct the text here just a little bit. Um, uh, it should be merchant man. The word for man, anthropos, is there in the text, and I have no idea why the New King James Version left it out. <clears throat> the King James Version includes it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if it's just a way to economize words. Um, it's in both <laughs> the uh, Texas Receptus and the critical text. It's <coughs> there, but most of the critical text uh, translations don't include it. And, mm -hmm. and you're going, why are you going on about this? Um, because having that a Merchant man, a man, shows us once again that this is Jesus. Now this parable sounds very much like the previous parable, or at least, at least it seems to be conveying the same message. Uh, and its point is very similar. And almost everything we discussed in the previous parable absolutely positively applies here. And his point is very, uh, what's different is the object being purchased. It's no longer a treasure hidden in a field or a field being purchased to get, it's a pearl of great value. While the treasure hidden in the field was the children of Israel, the pearl of great price is the church. The bride of Jesus. And I really wish I had an awesome, great, direct reference like I had for all of that. Um, but I don't. But let's look at where pearls come from. Pearls come from the sea. The sea in biblical typology or symbolism always <coughs> represents the collective governments or political systems of, of all the nations of the world. 
So, for example, in Revelation 13.1, when I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. This is not literally a beast rising up out of the ocean. It is, um, heads have always in, uh, represented leaders, rulers. Um, horns are power, leaders with power. Um, they wouldn't rise up out of the sea, but they rise up out of or above all the other nations of the world. This is seven uh, powerful nations with perhaps ten smaller nations doing their bidding, they rise up out of or above all the other nations of the world. So the sea represents political systems, um, governments. Um, so the pearl here represents the church or the Gentile bride of Christ. While this, this church does contain some Jews, it is predominantly made up of Gentiles drawn out of all of the nations of the world. The disciples most likely would have gotten that the treasure in the field represented Israel. It was a, a practically a citation of, of multiple times where God himself said, you're my special treasure. And they might have been feeling pretty good about themselves. <laughs> and then Jesus says, wait a minute, I didn't come just to redeem Israel, the wife of God, but also to draw out a people for myself from all the nations of the world. So in these two parables, we see the whole of the Bible. The Old Testament, Genesis through the book of John and the New Testament are summed up in the parable of the treasure in the field. And the whole of the New Testament, Matthew through Jude, is summed up are condensed into the parable of the pearl of great price. And yes, I included the four Gospels in both because the life of Jesus, um, in him we see the culmination of the Old Testament as well as the beginning of the New Covenant or the New Testament simultaneously at one time. Everything literally revolves around the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Everything. Now what is true of, of a whole, if we're going to say this is beautiful and lovely and desirable, um, then every part that makes up that whole, that must be true of as well. So if Jesus looks at the pearl, the whole church, and finds it so lovely and appealing that he is willing to give up everything he has to obtain it, then he must, by extension, feel that way about everything that makes up the pearl as a whole. If you believe in Jesus, if he has called you and you have responded in faith to that call, Jesus considers <coughs> you, you, a pearl of great price. He has searched the world over to find you, and when he saw you, he instantly saw value in you. A value the seller obviously didn't see, or he would not have put you up for sale. <laughs> <laughs> and what? And based on what Jesus sees in you, he has run out and sold all that he has just so he could buy you for himself. So tell me, how do you see yourself tonight? How do you see yourself right now? Just sit and ponder for a minute. Just a minute. How lovely you must be in Jesus' eyes. He gave up unlimited power, glory, riches, and separated himself on some level from the perfect, selfless, <coughs> unending love that he had known for an eternity and lived the life of a servant in a body of flesh that had first been created by his own hands. 
and quickened by his own spirit. And he lived that life knowing that it would end in a horrible, torturous death. And taking on the sin and shame of the whole world, he would descend into hell. And he did it all so he could purchase you out of the bondage of sin and death so that you could spend eternity in paradise with him. See yourself through those eyes and your perception of who you are and what you are worth will never, never be the same again. I guarantee it. Then realize that he feels the exact same way about the knucklehead sitting next to you. And you will never ever see them again the same way. <coughs> the perfect, jealous, self-sacrificing love of Jesus Christ defines everything. Verses 47 through 50. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore, and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So when Jesus takes possession of the scroll and opens it, the earth will again become his domain and all that is in it will come under his rule. The peoples of every nation and every ethnic group from every imaginable political system and government, great and small, are represented here by the fish in the sea. And every single one of them will know that Jesus is God and King. On that day, the kingdom of heaven, which we see in parts now, will then be completed and official. Jesus has paid the price of redemption for the earth, paid the debt owed for man's sins, and conquered the curse of it by rising from the dead. All that is left is for God the Father to tell Jesus, today's the day. <laughs> when Jesus returns to establish his kingdom in all its glory, it will be a very sad day for many. Because the first thing Jesus is going to do is clean house. Jesus will send his heavenly host to separate the just from the wicked. Now, wicked seems like a really strong word. Uh, and, and it is. And most people think, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not awesome. I'm not, you know, perfect. But I'm, I certainly don't qualify as wicked. Uh, I haven't murdered anybody, really. I mean, you know. Um, there was a time I cheated on my taxes, but I felt bad about it. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I'm certainly not wicked. So who are the wicked? And I think that's best identified, best answered by delineating first who are the just. The just are the saved. They will be gathered into the storehouse. But exactly who are the just? Paul tells us. Uh, this in Romans 1, 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Again he tells us in Galatians 3.11, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. 
The writer of Hebrews, again, Hebrews 10.38, The just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. And all of these are quoting Habakkuk 2.4, or Habakkuk, I don't know how you pronounce it. Um, <laughs> Habakkuk 2.4, Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. The just live by faith. Faith in what? This one's easy. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The just are the only ones saved. Everyone else is cast into the fire. Therefore, the only requirement to be labeled as wicked by the one, the only one whose opinion actually counts <laughs> is to not believe in Jesus. In fact, right after Jesus told us the requirements for getting in, he said this in John 3, 17 and 18, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. But he who does not believe in him is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. <coughs> so in this parable, it is the wicked who are condemned to the furnace and Jesus tells us that the way to be condemned is not to believe in him. The term wicked by God's definition, therefore, is an unbelievably broad term. Mm -hmm. In fact, is everything but those who put their faith in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And there could be some really good people out there yeah. who do moral things and, <clears throat> and exhibit common grace on a level that a lot of Christians don't. But if they don't believe in Jesus, and please notice that the wicked are not thrown into the furnace and annihilated. There is wailing and gnashing of teeth. The wicked are there for eternity. Eternal judgment and condemnation is real because Jesus says it is. Those who deny the existence of eternal judgment and condemnation by their own words show which group they belong to. If Jesus says it is a thing and you say it is not a thing, then you're calling Jesus a liar. You cannot have faith. How can you believe in someone you simultaneously claim is a liar? It just it doesn't work. In this explanation of the parable of the dragnet, Jesus is speaking very plainly. There is no wiggle room here. To try and twist what Jesus says here to fit your own personal theology is to deny God as he has defined himself. God defines us because we are created in his likeness and image. If we are defining God, then we show ourselves to be sons of the devil. Because from his first appearance in human history, that is what he did. Remember? You will not surely die. God's just making that up. <coughs> from the outset, that's what the devil did. Sought to define God in his own terms. And we believed him. It's very sad. And we're still believing it. And that's even sadder still. Verses 51 and 52. Jesus said to them, Have you understood all these things? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he said to them, Therefore, every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. 
first off, I'm just stunned that the disciples understood all that Jesus just told them because <laughs> we've been digging into this and there's a lot there. And they're like, yeah, we got it. <laughs> and, uh, and Jesus didn't dispute what they said. So um, I, I have to believe it's true. Um, otherwise, I think Jesus go, come on, really? I, I know better. Um, except without the sarcasm, that's all mine. Um, <laughs> I, I can't believe they didn't have like 500 questions. Yeah, I think I get this, but what, how's this got play? And nothing. <laughs> That's kind of an aside. <laughs> Notice, please, um, how Jesus describes what he has just done. He calls it instruction. The actual word in the Greek means to be a disciple of someone. So Jesus is using these parables and their explanations to instruct or disciple those who are following him. Hmm. Everything he has taught are aspects of the kingdom. So this is how we should be making disciples of people as hmm. well, by instructing them about the things of God and his coming kingdom. I can't think of a possibly better example of how we should disciple people than what Jesus did. <laughs> but in this, in this, Jesus also gives his disciples a role, or better yet, a title. He calls them scribes. In the secular world, scribes are people who record things that other people say and do. Generally important people, like government officials, generals, presidents, scribes record the proceedings in courts of law or at official government meetings so that a record of what is said and done can be preserved. In the religious realm, scribes would record the words of rabbis and priests so that their teachings or rulings on things could be preserved for others to read later. Scribes were also responsible for making copies of the Holy Scriptures. Um, there were no printing presses. All copies of the Holy Scriptures were handwritten. Yeah, except it's this way. Yeah. Thanks for... When you write out the Holy Scriptures over and over and over again, and you proofread other people's copies of the Holy Scriptures over and over and over again, you naturally begin to memorize a lot of it. So the scribes were often looked upon as teachers because they knew the Scriptures or the teachings of the rabbis so thoroughly from having written them down and then making multiple copies of them. Scribes had to be literate, able to read, write, and speak the language in which the rabbis spoke or the scriptures were written in. So a lot of the rabbis, a lot of the Jews of the day spoke in Greek, so they had to understand Greek, they had to understand Hebrew because the scriptures were written in Hebrew. Some of them, like the Septuagint, was written in Greek, and so these guys were intelligent. These guys uh, could read and write in a world where that was... <coughs> actually um, more of a rarity. And Jesus said this is what those he is discipling are to be for him. Scribes. And then notice where they draw their knowledge from. From things new and old. I think this, uh, I'm sure this verifies that the parable of the treasure in the field is an allusion to the history of the Old Covenant, and that the parable of the pearl of great price is referring to the New Covenant, the history of which they are actually seeing unfold before their eyes. There is a connector, therefore, therefore, Jesus would not be mentioning things old and new had he not spoken of things old and new prior to the therefore. Therefore, is saying, since you now know all of this, then this is true. <clears throat> and as scribes, he wants them to record and preserve. 
even if it is simply in their memories, all that they hear him say and see him do, so that it can be shared with others. But that in that sharing, he wants them to be ready to pull out things from what has already been written and be able to teach what he's doing right there, right then. In this book, now that we have it, it, it really is one <coughs> continuous story. The whole Bible, both Old and New Testaments, all point to one thing. The infinite worth, beauty, value, and saving power of Jesus Christ. And it should be taught that way. I said earlier that the Gospels can just as easily be grouped into the Old Testament as they are into the New. And both the Old Testament and the New Testament are just missing something without the other. To truly understand the Old Testament, you need to see how it all plays out in the end. <laughs> how many times have you watched the movie and at the end, suddenly all the stuff you saw in the beginning made sense? Oh, that's why he did that. <laughs> the end of the story. There's just something missing. <coughs> there are just so many things in the Old Testament that only make sense when you see them in the light of what Jesus said and did. Well, I think the message of Jesus or the New Testament in a lot of ways could stand on its own to some extent. Um, there are just a tons of things that on its own would seem unimportant. How many times have you read something and gone, it's just frivolous detail. Without the history of God's plan of redemption, as it is recorded in the Old Testament scriptures, that's what a lot of this just becomes. Why am I there? Who cares? That's to see the true beauty of what Jesus did on the cross of Golgotha, you have to see it through the lens of the Old Testament. The New Testament is a 3D movie. If you watch a 3D movie without the glasses, you can still take in most of the action and get the gist of the story. But if you put the 3D glasses on, it comes <coughs> alive. It's in your face. The colors explode, and special effects just jump out at you. The Old Testament is a set of 3D glasses for the New Testament. <laughs> And if the Old Testament wasn't important, then why would God preserve it for thousands of years? And why would Jesus and every single New Testament writer quote it? Mm -hmm. The Holy Scriptures, both old and new, are a treasure for us to draw from when we are telling people about Jesus. And in verse 53, now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these parables that he departed from there. So there's just this huge whipsaw in these three parables. On one hand, we have the incredible heart-melting story of all stone-melting story, because you get a stone melting story of all that God sacrificed to keep the promises he made to his people and also draw out a family for himself from among all the peoples of the world. And yet, while Jesus died to redeem the earth, to pay the debt of sin and conquer the curse of sin, for everyone. Clearly, not everyone will be saved by his efforts. On one hand, this passage tells us that we are more loved, wanted, and beautiful than we can possibly imagine because Jesus sold all he had to gain us. And on the other hand, this passage tells us that despite this unimaginable 
outpouring of love, men will still be lost. And it is not the price rendered by God. It's not that that's not sufficient to save all because it is. It's more than sufficient to save everyone in the whole world. The thing is that some see what God sacrificed for them and see no value in it. None. Some have no desire whatsoever for the salvation God purchased, Jesus purchased for them. And others think there's oh, there's some value in that. Yeah, and and I might like to be a part of some of that. Um, but somehow it's just less valuable to them than a whole lot of other things in this world. Neither of them will receive that yet. The only way to respond to an outpouring of love this monumental, this overwhelming, is to receive it and give yourself completely over to the one who so selflessly first loved you. If you do not treasure and cherish a love like this, you show yourself unworthy of it. Think about Jesus' incarnation. What it must have been like for Jesus to leave heaven and come down here and live in one of these bone bags. We get pictures of heaven from Isaiah and Revelation and Zechariah and and it's beautiful. It's absolutely gorgeous. Things we can't even describe. And there's always incense burning. And that's got to smell awesome. I'm big on smells. Bad smells really, really get to me. And so here's Jesus leaving a place that smelled like heaven. (laughs) (laughs) And coming down here to inhabit a body polluted by sin. Where the stench of sin is oozing out the pore of the very body that he has to live in. It'd be like leaving the streets of even Pueblo and going to some village in India where the, the sewers are ditches on the side of the road and people are out in the morning throwing garbage and human waste and if you're rich you have a tunnel from under your house to the common tunnel and if you're not rich you have to carry it out in a bucket or a pot and that's what Jesus did, and he did it with joy. Mm-hmm. And he lost that intimate fellowship that he had known for eternity. Before anything was, there was God perfectly in love with us. And powerless. Jesus didn't do a single thing that the Holy Spirit didn't do through him. He had spoken the cosmos into existence. He had formed man with his own hands. And he couldn't make himself a sandwich if God didn't (laughs) give him the power to do it. And he did it all so that he could be tortured and die and go to hell. And he suffered all of that with joy to purchase you. Everybody, look at somebody next to you going, he did all that for you. He did all of that (laughs) for you. Back in the back. For you. (laughs) How do you respond to that? You have to throw your 
you're down, down on your face and go, forgive me for every time that I have put anything in front of you. And then follow him anywhere he goes. My dog will follow me anywhere I go because I feed him and I pet him. <laughs> Jesus has died a horrible death and gave up unimaginable glory and riches. And we won't follow him across the street.